Today is going to be all about luxury. Through that journey, I ended up working in some fantastic cocktail bars and really was able to express myself. You're in India, I've been out to Taiwan, America, Latin America. You know, I'm, I'm so amazed at how much interest there is. It's a funny journey, uh, starting off many years ago in the kitchens here in Scotland. And, and here we are talking about some of the world's finest spirits. We had a small beer, but a, a big whiskey, and we sat and, you know, congratulated each other on his first grandchild, my first child, and it was a really special moment. And, and this goes back to a moment in time back in 1263, when a guy called Colin of Kintail saved King Alexander, the King of Scotland, from a charging stag. Because the, the, the 12 point stag tells this whole story. It's a huge story, a beautiful story of art, mm -hmm. of courage, of bravery, and of course, of the Scots of the day. Whiskey and sherry between one and two, uh, then my daughter, uh, number three, <laughs> uh, then my son, then football and rugby, and maybe my wife after that. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Discover series with the Whiskey Advisor, I'm Uday Balaji. So today is going to be all about luxury. So we are going to be discovering all things the Dalmo with Head of Whiskey Experience at White & Mackay, Daryl Haldane. Hi Daryl, how are you doing? Very well, very well. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Daryl. Really been looking forward to this conversation. But just before we dive into the conversation, I'd just like to ask all of you to please uh, like, subscribe, and hit that little bell, as always, so you'll get uh, notified every time we have a new video in the series. So, Daryl, I see you have quite a few uh, whiskeys lined up in front of you. I've only got one dram. So, uh, if you could choose one, you could just say cheers to everyone and uh, get right into the show. If you don't mind, what I'll do is I'll put mine on ice just now, if that's okay. Oh, well, okay. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'll save these for when we're doing the, the proper tasting. Um, uh -huh. It's still lunchtime here in Scotland, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to have this one on ice at the moment. Nice aperitif um, with the Dalmore 12. So, yeah, cheers to you. Thank Wonderful. you for having me, and cheers to you all watching. Thank you for being a slander. So, Darren, the first thing that is uh, really interested in knowing is you, your career has been split across two diff very different uh, spaces. One in the world where you were, you know, a uh, competitive bomb and must have been frenetic. And then you switched to some of the highest end single malts in the Scotch world from Diageo to the Macallan to now the Dalmo. And you're the head of whiskey experience. What a cool title. I just love to know about your journey and what you do on a daily basis as well. Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing journey, really, when you think about it. I, um, my, my father was a chef and mm -hmm. growing up uh, at home and in the kitchen and learning about lots of different flavors and experiences is, is something that sort of, I think subliminally, I was exposed to at quite a young age. And it's inevitable that I ended up working in hospitality. My uncle also mm -hmm. ran a restaurant. So uh, in the school holidays uh, and as a young guy, when I left school, I went to work in my uncle's restaurant and actually originally started for me in the kitchen. Um, but it's hard work in the kitchen and I, I also talk a lot. Uh, so I ended up getting kicked out of the kitchen basically and uh, told to go front of house. But I really enjoyed it. And uh, through that journey, I ended up working in some fantastic cocktail bars and really was able to express myself in, in a way that, yeah, I was kind of learning and it was a bit of a new experience for me. And standing up and presenting cocktails and, and the ideas why you've created those cocktails is actually something I really, really enjoyed. So that was the kind of start of it for me. And over time, as I worked with the drinks companies, um, my passion and understanding of whiskey just got, you know, for me, it just became more of a, it was very much a professional thing, but also I was getting a huge amount of it, you know, out of it personally. So for me, moving from the, the bartending side into the, the whiskey side and, and over time really specializing in whiskey you know here we are today we're talking about some fantastic single malts that are mm -hmm. available all over the world and, and that's something that really fascinates me is where this passion and thirst for knowledge comes from you're in india i've been out to taiwan america latin america you know i'm, I'm so amazed at how much interest there is in this product from the country where i'm from so you know, it's brilliant, it's very humbling, 
but also gives us a huge passion to continue to share these stories from these great distilleries. So it's a great pleasure, you know, and it's a funny journey uh, starting off many years ago in the kitchens here in Scotland. And, and here we are talking about some of the world's finest spirits. Mm -hmm. it, I know exactly what you mean uh, about kitchens being tough. I used to run restaurants and uh, looking at things in the kitchen, I was so glad that I was a guy running in and not being in that, you know, 50 degree environment right in front of yeah. all those uh, burners and stuff. But on to something a little cooler and fun. Uh, we do a rapid fire every uh, episode. So when you're ready, I can ask you the questions. I am ready almost go? ready. Yeah. <laughs> They're not that tough, don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, your first whiskey. Uh-huh, Ardbeg 10. Oh, that's uh, quite a bomb to start with. <laughs> and your favorite bar in the world? The favorite bar in the world would be, oh, my favorite bar in the world, Bar Termini in Soho. Oh, I've been there. I've been there. So my cousin lives around the corner from there. Uh, so what is your favorite cuisine? This is going to be a tough one. Very easy. And uh, this is mm. not to compliment you, but uh, Indian cuisine. My, uh, my wife is, her father is actually from South Africa, but uh -huh. his, his, his parents and grandparents were Indian. Um, so we eat Indian food all the time. So Indian food is my favorite cuisine. Yeah. Oh, wow. And some bunny chow as well? Bunny chow. Oh, man, that's it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I was in South Africa about a year and a half ago. And I mm -hmm. had my first bunny chow in South Africa. They're from Durban, Peter Maritzburg, mm -hmm. actually. Okay. And uh, yeah, bunny chow is uh, delicious. Yep. And whenever I hear South Africa, I think of the braai, you know, nothing better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your favorite sport there? I, I'm a mass, it, it's 50 50. It's soccer, football, and rugby. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is it cats or dogs for you? Dogs. Mm hmm. Books or music? Music. Beaches or mountains? Beaches. Mm -hmm. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Batman or Superman? Batman. Okay, then this is uh, the last one. Which is your favorite whiskey memory, though? My favorite whiskey memory? I, I have got many. I really do. Um, the easiest one is... Um, with my father-in-law probably the the day that my little girl was born actually was the 26th of November back in 2012 and uh, my wife stayed in the hospital uh, for a couple of days and uh, she was staying overnight and, and I think we got out of the hospital I think they kicked me out of the ward at about eight o'clock in the evening and um, I went to a good friend of uh, ours through the industry um, a guy called James Nisbet has a pub called the Windsor Arms, which is in the Leith area of Edinburgh on the north mm -hmm. side of town. I went there with my father-in-law and my brother-in-law and we sat down. We had a small beer, but a, a big whiskey. And we sat and, you know, congratulated each other on his first grandchild, my first child. And it was a really special moment. So, yeah, that's a, that's a whiskey memory for me that will, you know, never, never leave me. Oh, wow. That's a wonderful memory. So uh, when my daughter was born, I snuck a few minis into uh, the hospital because I was staying there the night. I didn't end up opening it though. About a week later, I opened this 43-year-old uh, space cider that a friend of mine had sent oh, wow. me just a sample for when my daughter was born. What a, what a memory that was. I was really, really close to visiting the Dalmore a couple of years back. I had gone for the Donnock Whiskey Festival. And unfortunately, the distillery, this was quite late in the year, so I couldn't get to go to the distillery. But uh, next time, for sure. But, was, this, uh, was this last year, Uday? Uh, the year before 2018. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there was some work going on at the distillery, so uh, they weren't open to visitors. You're right. So we've actually just completed a refurb um, mm -hmm. of, the, of the kind of visitor center site. So um, the next time you come, the distillery is looking incredible and we've got some Lovely. beautiful bits and pieces there to show you. So yeah, next time you come, make sure you let me know and uh, I'll meet you there. We'll go for a whiskey. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to it. But uh, talking about the Dalmore Distillery, Daryl, uh, it's one of those brands that's become, you know, kind of synonymous with uh, luxury. 
uh, whether it's like the super high age statement whiskies or the collaborations with people like Massimo Bottura uh, and it's just constantly pushing the bar. But I'm guessing this wasn't the case, you know, when it started back in the 1800s and over time it's become this uh, icon of luxury. So how did this come to be? Could you just give us a little bit of history? So I think the success is down to few key ingredients that really stand Dalmore apart from many of its peers. And this first one I'm going to talk to you about is the, the Royal Heritage. And on each bottle of the Dalmore is a 12-point Royal Stag. And, and this goes back to a moment in time back in 1263, when a guy called Colin of Kintail saved King Alexander, the King of Scotland, from a charging stag. This stag um, was, was put down by Colin with a spear and and he stepped in front of the king to protect him. And for his efforts and his valiancy, he was, he was gifted the right to use the 12-point royal stag on the Mackenzie coat of arms. He was awarded the right to use the term Lucio non oro. And he was also gifted the lands of Elan Donan. And Elan Donan today mm. is home to the Elan Donan castles. It's one of the most picturesque and photographed castles here in Scotland. So these guys in the early days were... A, you know, they, they, had, they had been really welcomed and embraced by the Royal uh, Scots at the time. So the Mackenzies, a very notable family here in Scotland. Uh, as time went on, the distillery was opened by a guy called Alexander Matheson. He was a very wealthy man, had made money out Far East and also in London here in the United Kingdom. He moved to the north of Scotland and established the Dalmore distillery. But like many people of his time and, and of his wealth, he wasn't particularly interested in running the distillery himself. He would lease it out to tenants who could run the distillery on his behalf. Mm -hmm. And the Mackenzies were one of those tenants and they arrived in 1867, bringing with them this 12 point Royal Stag. And ever since then, the Dalmore has been associated with this. Time would pass again, 500 years later almost, to the late 1700s, a very famous painter called Benjamin West painted a picture called Death of the Stag. And when I say a picture, I mean a huge painting that is 12 foot wide by seven foot tall and actually mm -hmm. hangs on the walls of the National Galleries here in Edinburgh, just 10 minutes from where I live. And when you do come to Scotland, I'll show you this beautiful painting. Mm -hmm. And we're not allowed to have a whiskey in front of the painting, sadly, because of the insurance, because mm -hmm. it's a a beautiful dark spirit they don't let us drink it so we may have to have a glass of champagne or something but mm -hmm. i'll take you to a place for a great whiskey after we view it and and i, I do think that this is one of the major things about the dalmore is this royal heritage because the, the the 12 point stag tells this whole story it's a huge story a beautiful story of art mm -hmm. of courage of bravery and of course of the scots of the day and i think that's something that really is a, a special moment for for dalmore and the other thing, as I mentioned, was the Mackenzies arriving. When they arrived, they, they inherited the stills, which had full-bodied, new-make spirit, which could mature for a long time across lots and lots of different cask types. The Mackenzies had a passion and a, and a real knowledge of great sherry casks. They themselves were involved with the sherry industry and the port mm -hmm. industry back in the late 1800s. We go to 1915, where we have the first letters and exchanges between Gonzalez Bias and the Dalmore. Okay. And they're still our key partners today, well over 100 years later. So the curation of exquisite casks is something that we cherish, something we're experts in, and something that we have learned a huge amount from the Mackenzies. And of course, we have our, fa you know, uh, uh, say a father figure, but really the the, the nose, you know, the guy who looks after all of these casks, who's responsible for pulling together all of these beautiful Dalmore whiskies, you know, the master who is Richard Patterson. And he is, I guess, the, the final piece of that, you know, this idea of creating masterpieces. He is an artist. There's no doubt about it. And what he's done for the Dalmore over the years is, is, is very special. What he's done for the industry is very mm -hmm. special. You know, a guy with a huge amount of personality and charisma, but also experience and knowledge and creativity. And these are things that 
you can attribute not just to him, but also to the Dalmore as a, as a whiskey. So yeah, three or four things I think that make this distillery really, really special that set it apart from others that we continue today, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, since you mentioned Gonzalez Bias and uh, the casks, <clears throat> a couple of years back, I went down to uh, Jerez as well and went down to the Tio Pepe Bodega. And there's such a variety of sherry, you know, and it's kind of uh, a bit misleading a little bit when you just say sherry matured, sherry finished, but there's, it's such a world of flavors and types of sherries and casks out there. Even, you know, uh, seasoned versus uh, a solera cask, for example. And yeah. one thing that I keep seeing when um, the Dalmo comes up is the Matusalam casks. So could you just yeah. tell us a little more about these Matusalam casks and a little more uh, deeper knowledge about uh, the sherry and port cask would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sherry is something I'm massively passionate about. And, and I've been very lucky over the years to have spent a lot of time in the south of Spain working with the cooperages and the bodegas. And yeah, I mean, th this, this industry has a huge amount of texture. Um, when we say sherry, you know, I, I think people automatically think of something uh, that has a flavor profile. They think of a, uh, maybe a slightly old fashioned view of, of mm -hmm. a category, you know, that, that maybe our grandparents were much more familiar with than maybe my generation is. Um, and I can understand why that is. But for me personally, it is my love. Um, I am very lucky to work in whiskey. I am really, you know, passionate about it. But, you know, it's right up there in terms of the things that I value in life. And sherry is, for me, mm -hmm. absolutely up there. Whiskey and sherry between one and two. Uh, then my daughter, uh, number three. <laughs> Uh, then my son, then football and rugby, and maybe my wife after that, you know, so there's a, it, it's right up there for me. Within the sherry industry, you have lots of different types of sherry and styles, but they're all based on just a few grapes, uh, Palomino Fino, Moscatel, and you also have Pedro Jimenez. Pedro Jimenez are the sweet ones. They're nice and juicy, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, they, they're almost like treacle in the way that they look in the bottle, the Pedro Jimenez wines. So what we have access to at the Dalmore is some of the rarest and the oldest aged wines from Gonzalez Bias. And a great example of this is the Methuselah. The Methuselah wine itself is, you know, sweet. It has this lovely licorice kind of aroma. So sweetness is, is, is there, but it's like a, a spiciness and a sweetness at the same time. Uh, you have lots of fruits, lots of chocolates. And what we do is we take these casks from the Solera, mm -hmm and then we send them to Scotland. And then what we will do is enhance our whiskies in those. Our whiskies at the Dalmore, so this 12 year old is a great example, will spend most of its life in an ex bourbon cask. That's the first mm -hmm. stage of maturation. And then what we'll do is we'll take around 50% of the whiskey away from the bourbon and we'll pop it into some of these beautiful Methuselah and also Sherry casks. And what will then happen is that the, the cask will gift the whiskey lovely fruits, depth of flavor and complexity and some of these spice notes that I mentioned like mm -hmm. licorice, nutmegs and cloves. So that's how we get that lovely complexity through the whiskies. So as you go around the bodegas, you'll find there are different saleras with different mm -hmm. wines in them. And when we use those different wines, what we get is different influences. So this is another one called Apostoles. Apostoles mm -hmm. is a Palo Cortado style of wine. Um, slightly different, uh, maybe more, more salinity coming through, slightly salty. You actually get a lovely salted caramel character coming through from these Apostoles casts. So we'll use these to get a slightly different influence from uh, our Dalmore single malts. So yeah, the, that's a, a sort of snapshot of, of, of how we go about doing this. And it's a real partnership. Uh, we have Richard Patterson here at the Dalmore, of course, uh, I've already mentioned him. Uh, but over at Gonzalez Bias, we also have a gentleman called Antonio Flores. And Antonio mm -hmm. Flores is effectively their master of wine and master distiller. So he's the expert in the casks in the bodegas. And he works very closely with Richard to source these beautiful casks from Gonzalez Bias. So watching these two guys work uh, as statesmen of the industry is uh, something as a, a young guy trying to make his way in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a huge amount of... Um, 
fun, uh, but also lots and lots of knowledge and expertise from those guys as well. And the great thing about them is they're so happy to help and pass on the information so that we can share it with, you know, the rest of the world. So, you know, that's a, that's a very, very short version of, of how we go mm -hmm. out there and, and get Sherry casks. Um, but, you know, these guys are working so hard to create some of the most beautiful wines in the world. And as a real advocate and, you know, custodian of, of whiskey, uh, I feel very similarly about Sherry because of the collaborative nature and how closely we need to work to get exceptional whiskey because Sherry casks can have such a beautiful impact on our whiskies. Mm -hmm. And I'm also just going to quickly mention that the Dalmo, Jura and John Bar are represented in India by uh, Vibev, really dynamic company uh, is bringing us these brands. And I'm just going to put their details down in the description, guys. Please go and uh, take a look. Um, but that will just to close out on a lighter note. Uh, and I asked Steve this as well uh, when we did Jura. What's it like working with Mr. Richard Patterson? Do you have any stories? Yeah, um, well, I, have I got stories? I, I think I do. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share them all right enough because uh, <laughs> he, he might watch this. Um, one, of, one of the things I think that, that's really interesting about Richard is that he, he is a guy that has been in the industry. He's been working for White and Mackay for 50 years. And I've worked with a few different whiskey makers over the years. Um, Jim Beveridge is one that I met, Maureen mm -hmm. Robertson over the years. Um, I worked with a gentleman called uh, Bob Dalgarno. Uh, who was a very well-known whiskey maker here in yeah. Scotland and a very creative guy and a great relationship with Bob. And, you know, he's had a really a good time, a lot of fun, learned huge amounts from him. And I, I think what, um, what I found when I started to work with Richard was he, I thought, was a guy that would be difficult to approach. It would be mm -hmm. difficult to ask him lots of questions because he's very busy. Um, and again, like young guys like us coming through, uh, you know, how, how much time is he going to give us, really, you know, when we're mm -hmm. asking all the silly questions uh, under the sun. And what I found is he has so much time. Um, he picks up the phone every time you phone him, no matter what time of day it is. And mm -hmm. he's the first in the office. He's often the last out of the office as well. And now he's worked. I'm not going to give away his age, um, but <laughs> he's been working for White and Mackay for 50 years. You know, so mm -hmm. that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing um, to still have that passion uh, to still have that ability mm -hmm. to give everybody time and make everybody feel special. And that's something that, that he takes great pride in. And, and, I, and I think he would take it very personally if he found that somebody had not felt that about him. So, yeah, I mean, I just, I, I think it's a pretty inspirational person, to be honest. And, and not, not because of his whiskey making capability, that, that's unquestionable, but just his work ethic and the way that he deals with people was something I, I, I didn't expect from a person like him. Um, and it's actually, is, it, it's one of his greatest attributes. That's so wonderful to hear. And uh, of course, what an entertainer he is. Huh? Well, it's, you know, yeah, I've, I've, <laughs> I've, bumped, I've, I've seen presentations. Uh, I've, I've, I've worked in the whiskey industry my, pretty much my whole working life now. And, and I've, I've, I've been over in Asia and Singapore for Masters of Wine and Spirits and things. And I've, and I've watched Richard do his thing. And yeah, I mean, he, he, he paved the way for guys like us, really. I mean, when you think mm -hmm. about, you know, brand ambassadors and, and, and brand communicators and people that go out there and share the stories from these great distilleries, uh, Richard did that in a way in the early days that was, was a bit unusual, which was fun, lighthearted, engaging, but also full of great information. And he, he still does that today. And, and, and people like him created the role of the brand ambassador because it then became a full-time job because people wanted Richard at every whiskey event, at every <laughs> tasting, at every whiskey show. And it's really funny now, uh, and I'll tell you a funny story about Richard in a second. And now everybody wants Richard on Zoom, on Teams, <laughs> on Instagram Live. And, and actually, I think some people forget it's actually quite hard work presenting to these. Mm -hmm. it, it's easy it's easy one-on-one -on -one because I can see you, I can interact with you and we have body language and all of the stuff that mm -hmm. helps a conversation flow. When you're doing it on a Zoom with two or 300 people, it's very difficult because you don't have any interaction. You can't oh, okay. read people mm -hmm. or anything like that. So you have to give it that extra 25%. And, and Richard gives it an extra 50%. So when the end of the day comes, he must be exhausted after all mm -hmm. of these things. But when I'm on my phone at 10 o'clock at night, 
I go onto Facebook or something, there's Richard doing a tasting with, you know, the whiskey cast over in America. Mm -hmm. um, I wake up at two in the morning, I turn my phone on. There's Richard live doing a session with Singapore, you know, and I'm going, this guy doesn't sleep. It's insane, you know, <laughs> it's unbelievable. So he's, he loves it. He's so passionate about it. And that's one of the things that's so inspirational. But I was in my kitchen um, mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the, this COVID lockdown here in the UK, uh, having a meeting with Richard. And mm -hmm. um, I, I have two children and my wife works in the hospital. So I've, okay. I've been kind of spinning plates like everybody else around the world. And everyone's met our children. I've met most people's pets, most of their children. You know the situation. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, we're having a conversation, Richard and I. It was actually about something reasonably important and he was giving me information on a few things uh, in preparation of some tastings and uh, Richard and I are chatting away and my children start playing up anyway I, I have to go and look after the little boy he's three and he's mm -hmm. destroying the living room or something like that I come back and Molly mm -hmm. and my daughter who is seven and Richard are having a full-blown conversation about flavor <laughs> you know oh, and, wow. and he's, oh. he's asking Molly what does she smell is she good at it how does she get on with it? You know, and I'm, I'm sort of sitting there going, I actually just want to watch this. This is brilliant. You know, <laughs> here we weird. have a, mm -hmm. one of the legends of whiskey having a proper conversation with my little girl about her nose and how she smells things. And, and you know, that's one of the memories, one of the things from this COVID lockdown that I am going to remember forever. And it's, a, a, again, it's a great testament to the patience and mm. the people orientated way that, that Richard is. He enjoys these conversations every time he has them. And sometimes you have to pull him out of them, you know, and it, it's <laughs> just a, what a passionate, what a passionate person. And if we, if we were all like that, the, the Scotch whiskey industry will be in great hands. Mm -hmm. That's so heartwarming to hear something like that, you know, it's really beautiful. Um, yeah. But Daryl, it's been absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Uh, guys, if you want to reach out uh, to Daryl, I'm going to put his details down in the description below. Please feel free to reach out. And I'll also put some more details about uh, the Dalmo and White Mackay, as well as the YouTube channels for both the brands up here. Uh, so please go and check them out. So Daryl, any last words for our viewers? Thank you so much for spending the time and enjoying some of these beautiful whiskies with us. Um, I hope you one day when you do make the trip to Scotland, you let us know. Uh, come and see the beautiful Dalmore distillery. And if you're ever passing through Edinburgh, need a good place to go for a great whiskey and see this beautiful Benjamin West painting here in the National Galleries, you know where we are. Our details are there. And thank you so much for, for joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here with us, Daryl. Cheers. So guys, that was an absolutely fabulous conversation with Daryl talking about casks to everything else down to pairing as well. So a lot of ideas for you to go and try out now. So as always, I've got to ask you to please like, subscribe and hit the little bell to get notified every time we have a video on the series. Until next week, cheers guys.